Let me call the meeting of the actual committee of the Pension Review Board to order. Let's see, all three members of the committee are here. And we're here to make this a work session, working on the, the financial adequacy or inadequacy report, possible changes that can be made to various retirement systems. Chris, with that introduction, I'll turn it to, to you. Uh, yeah, members, I guess the first uh, item would be the uh, approval of the minutes, which we had presented uh, as a draft at the last board meeting. Um, I didn't know if any of the members had changes, uh, but that would be the first item on the agenda. This was a meeting we held where we were right here in the same location? Yes. Right. I, I move approval, Mr. Chair. Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye, aye. Um, all right, members, the, the, the next item, and, and for members of the audience, we have handouts available if you haven't had an opportunity to, uh, to get them. Uh, we have all the handouts that are in our packet. Uh, the first item that we put in there for the committee members uh, is our PRB guidelines for actuarial soundness. And we included this again uh, as this has been the um, minimum standard and best practice that the board has recommended uh, for funding a defined benefit public retirement system. And some of the discussion that the, in, in the reports the staff has prepared utilizes uh, these guidelines. And as we move forward with drafting the preliminary report, uh, staff wanted to make sure that there were uh, no additional suggestions from the committee members in terms of using the 40-year minimum uh, amortization period and a sufficient contribution rate to fund the unfunded liability over a 40-year period as the basic litmus test to fulfill the study. Uh, again, the study uh, calls on the board to determine each system's ability to meet its long-term obligations uh, taking into account the contributions made to, the benefits paid by, and the investments made by the retirement system. Uh, the board for, uh, since 1984, has used the guidelines as that minimum standard, and, and staff was going to proceed uh, with the idea that anything over a 40-year amortization period, uh, as that is the minimum uh, requirement to be considered actuarially sound, uh, would not be deemed as sufficient uh, contribution arrangement or funding arrangement uh, to meet your long-term uh, obligations. Uh, that's somewhat how we proceeded through all these meetings, but again, uh, we just wanted to, to put that uh, discussion out there. Secondly, the board has adopted a recommended range of 15 to 25 years. Uh, and as we move forward, what we've kind of done is organize the system's amortization periods on those groups, greater than 40, uh, between 25 and 40, and within the recommended range of better. I know in the past, uh, uh, Chris, I've mentioned to you and perhaps to others that there's a, a pretty strong sentiment now in the actuarial profession that 40 years is too long. Uh, and so if we were writing from a blank sheet and developing an amortization period, I would be, I would be suggesting a shorter amortization period than 40 years. But but we're not really with a blank slate. We have guidelines that are in effect that were thoroughly deliberated and fairly recently, um, three years ago maybe, finally adopted. And that the best time for us to revise the guidelines is as a separate task after the session of the legislature, uh, in, in my opinion, that if we were to begin to modify the guidelines in any way and say, for example, 40 years is not acceptable, uh, then it, it, we would need to get into more conversation Well, what is acceptable. So I think the timing is such that it's better to, to stay with these guidelines and then debate them as a separate project next year. I could not agree more, and I definitely think that 40 years is too long, but the timing is, is not right. Should be an issue that the uh, committee and the board ought to take up next year. It is an important issue, but and, and, and certainly we can um, address that issue as, as we move forward. I think, that given that um, 
the, the, these guidelines, as you mentioned, were adopted again in 2011, uh, and we did look at that issue then. Um, uh, that, that, in the essence of how we've reported everything to date and to uh, the, the actuaries in the state who've used these guidelines, um, that we want to be consistent with those. If the members are, are comfortable with that, as we have been, uh, that will be how staff will move forward as we uh, take all the information and coalesce it into the report. It's a good thing to raise this one, I guess I'd call it a final time for, for how we're going to do this, this report. All right, members, in, in that case, as we move forward, the next item, uh, and, and we have presented the uh, June 2014 actuarial evaluations report. Um, this, what we've added, and I know we've made amendments to this report per me, uh, members' suggestions, we wanted to add one additional column in there, uh, and this is an issue that we wanted to ask the members about. Um, we've added a plan status column, uh, and it differentiates, we've identified essentially three statuses, an active plan, uh, which is uh, a plan obviously that's got current members, new members. We also have uh, added closed, which in our definition means closed to new hires. So there are still benefit accruals for existing members. However, new uh, employees of that uh, sponsoring government are not uh, enlisting in that plan. And then lastly, what we're calling frozen, which is benefit accruals for all members of that plan have frozen. One of the reasons we wanted to, to bring this to the members' attention is as we've looked at historic information and we've tried to compare, let's say, funded ratios or cash flows, um, demographics, for instance, that changes for the, the plan type. If you're a frozen plan and nobody new has come in in 10 years, well, your active to retired ratios are going to be uh, we would interpret it, say, differently than an active plan. Because uh, naturally, a frozen plan, eventually that number would go to zero um, for active members. So one of the points we wanted to bring up to the committee was, as we move forward with the study and we evaluate each system's ability to meet its long-term obligations, do we want to take into consideration those plans that are no longer active? Um, and within those two categories of close to new hires, and frozen, do we continue to differentiate those out? Um, as a caveat to that, um, the J judicial retirement system one is a pay-as-you-go system. Uh, it has no assets. It's had no assets in trust for many, many years. The legislature appropriates the benefits. Um, we've always kind of treated it as a 30-year um, uh, amortization period, although it's really that's. I'm not sure Dan could probably speak more to that, but again, that's a plan with no assets. So it meeting its long-term obligations is really dependent on the legislature funding those members, which has always been the case. So do we differentiate that system as well? Uh, and so that was one of the points we wanted to discuss with the committee. Uh, kind of secondly to that is the presentation of this report, which we've made to the board and the committee for several years now, when we include the actuarial information for each system as it stands um, to make sure it's readable and in a usable format. The thought was to maybe focus on a smaller subset within each plan of the information, um, but we wanted to get some feedback from the members on that or if they were happy with presenting the information as, as we've laid it out here. Uh, the thought would be, do we, do we include in this report, let's say the current actuarial uh, funding period, do we include every item uh, in there? Do we scale it back, or do we include more than what we have? Is there anything that we're missing? Uh, so we did want to get feedback from the committee members on that. For a judicial one that is a pay-as-you-go system, I, I would suggest a different approach there. Create a fourth status called pay-as-you-go uh, for them, because they're, they're, the 30-year organization has no uh, connection to, to what they're doing. I appreciate the, uh, the label, just knowing whether the plan is uh, active, closed, or frozen, and uh, share Bob's view would be helpful to know uh, for those plans that are pay as you go. Um, are any of the, uh, is the plan you alluded to, the judicial plan, it's on the uh, here? Yes. That's the one? Yes, it is. 13 members? Yes. 
13 active members. All, all new members and for several years go into judicial retirement system too. They closed that plan, uh, I believe, in the 80s. So it's closed and pay as you go? Yes. And again, I think we'll, as we've begun to look at it, when we did the kind of aggregate look as we get into that next report, we've identified, when we look at outliers, you know, uh, demographics, um, funded ratios, things like that, we start to notice, and as we, it, typically we've just presented it as one list, but I think when we get into something as nuanced as this report, it does help to identify those different characteristics, because you may evaluate a frozen plan uh, its ability to meet its long-term obligations a little bit differently than maybe an active, open, defined benefit plan. Uh, but we did want to get some feedback from the committee uh, on that, or um, obviously they still have obligations to meet. And so the question would be, do you group them together in, in maybe a presentation such as this, but include the plan status, or do you say all actives in one chart maybe separate out uh, uh, the frozen and the closed plans? Within kind of here are all the frozen plans, here are all the closed plans, here are all the active plans. Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't see a reason to separate those out, but I find the, as I mentioned, I find the labeling to be helpful so we can consider it in the proper context. I, yeah, I agree with that. I, I, but I don't think we need to subdivide the... Uh, as for the information that's presented... Frozen. I'm sorry. You as for the information that's presented here, I find it to be helpful. might be something to take out or add, but I find it to be a helpful overview of the, uh, of the plans. I agree. I mean, as a layperson, not in the pension world, I can understand this, and a lot of the people that are making the decisions reading this report are not in the pension world. One, one thing that, that we are doing that we previously, just for the benefit of anybody in the audience that hasn't followed our previous meetings, there had been historically, uh, uh, in, in the case of a number of plans, uh, we, we would describe them as having a 30-year a amortization period because that was a, a, a GASB 25-27 ARC, but it, it was not related to what the employer was actually contributing. And so we are, we're changing to place the emphasis in terms of determining the amortization period on what is a best estimate of what the employer is actually contributing and that will uh, that will cause an amortization period to be greater than or less than 30 years but it won't just it won't be 30 years unless we have a plan the time the only time we would have a 30 year is if a plan is is recalculating an arc every year with a 30 year amortization or uh, or a 30-year open amortization where they would roll it over, that would be an example where we would still see a 30-year amortization. But we've, we've moved away, that's, that's misleading to say that that's what the, an ideal might be, but it's not what they're contributing uh, if with the 30 years. So we're, we have, that's a previous change. That we'll be gradually refining that and looking for nuances and what the best estimate is for an amortization period. And, and members, one of the challenges of this study is to be as current as possible with the information. And there are systems that are evaluating changes currently, uh, that have implemented changes that haven't necessarily maybe been reflected in the report. Uh, I know that uh, the staff is doing uh, the, the best we can to make sure we communicate that. There will be a period of time between the preliminary report and the final report for systems to comment and if there is more current information, I think our goal is to make sure that we accurately reflect in the December report, the December 31st deadline report to the legislature, the most current and accurate information for every system. Um, and so there will be a period as, as outlined in the, the legislation for systems to respond. And if there are contributions that go up, I know, for instance, uh, the Texas Emergency Services Retirement System uh, just adopted uh, rule or post uh, adopted rules that will increase their contributions from their member cities, uh, which will impact their funded status in their next valuation. Um, and so we're trying to work with those systems to make sure that we accurately reflect what is their, their current funding arrangement 
since the funding arrangement is how we're determining their ability to meet their long-term obligations. Uh, at some point, uh, probably at the board meeting in August, at the board meeting in August, uh, staff will ask the board to set probably a deadline for systems to provide us as current information as possible to make sure that we issue, when we issue the report in December, staff have time to prepare everything for the board's <coughs> approval. Uh, we can't be receiving information the day before the December board meeting. Uh, that's just not going to be feasible. Uh, but we do need to communicate that to the systems far enough in advance so that they uh, have a working deadline as well. Uh, so, but that, that'll be from the point of adopting the preliminary report uh, and, and moving forward from the August meeting. I might just raise this question uh, to committee members and Chris. Uh, I think it would be useful is to get audience comment as we take up subjects like we, for example, pause now and see if the audience has any comments on the PRB guideline question we've already discussed, uh, and then, uh, and are the, the, the amortization question, and my comment about how we're changing that. Um, if, so if there's no objection, I'm going to throw it open to the audience to comment if you have a comment. We don't want to drag the meeting out unnecessarily long, but we're here to look substantively at these issues. So I'm certainly interested in audience comment. Chris? I have a couple of comments. First, uh, if you have an overfunded plan, a lot of times they have like an open 30 year amortization period. And I would recommend you use a zero. It would just be confusing if you have overfunded plans showing amortization periods. And I guess second, that, that at least for our for TCRS and TMRS, you have various categories, and I would encourage you to let us. Uh, we're, we're supposed to uh, list the number of plans by amortization period. I encourage you to let us kind of customize those to meet our own funding requirements. Like we have a closed 20-year amortization period, so if we're showing between. 20 and 30 years, I guess that has some sort of meaning, but nobody's going to be greater than 20 ever. And so it would probably be more helpful for at least some systems to be able to, uh, to, to customize that to meet their actual funding policy. Chris, if all of the plans in your system are using an amortization period of 20 years or less. Yeah, our amortization period is 20 years, except if you're overfunded, it's a 30 year open, and it's a layered approach. So basically every plan that's playing payments required rate and isn't overfunded has a 20 year amortization period. We have about a quarter of our plans that have an elected rate. They elect to pay higher than is required. And so they would have an amortization period of more than zero and less than 20. Otherwise, is that a rolling 20? It's not a rolling 20. We do a new layer every year, but that year's uh, unexpected change in your accrued liability and you amortize that new layer over 20 years. So we, every year you have, you have basically a new, uh, new, a new thing that you're amortizing. And you have a new layer that's 20, but the old layers are dro have dropped dropping, down. Yeah, every, yeah, so it's not, it's wow. not rolling, yeah. And, and do, you, do you develop a, an average of those where you have layers to get one aggregate average? No, we, we just say it's 20 is how we approach That's a good point, it's, uh, so we're not, we're not doing some sort of aggregate approach and we're not looking, we have like five year assets meeting and we're not assuming that everything, all, all the assumptions are being met and realizing the asset gains and losses. We are not taking that into account either. So, Why, why, don't, why don't you, here's a suggestion for the committee, why don't, why don't you, and I'd make making a similar comment for our TMRS, um, offer later, offer specific questions and let us talk back and forth with with each of you in terms of how to do this. I know that the, uh, there's a lot of advantage in what TCD is doing. Hey, one disadvantage is it's pretty darn complicated in terms of following those amortization periods and, and different pieces with different amortization periods. Uh, it makes it harder to explain. 
And, and members, and, and for, for uh, TMRS and TGS, we have some of the information we discussed, and we, I, we did have on a staff level preliminary discussion that we wanted to get to uh, towards the end of the packet uh, to address some of the, these comments. Um, I think on this report, the question might be, again, identifying those two systems as uh, multi-employer systems as well that have, if we're going to look at individual amortization periods of the systems, identify that and make sure that if there's an aggregate amortization period for TCD or TMRS that, that, that's on this list, that we also probably need to footnote them as well because um, there will be a, more detail on those two systems uh, and, and we can get into that. We have the handouts that we have for the audience that we have in your packet. Yeah. Kind of I think the main point I was trying to say is just that they, the, way, the way you calculate amortization periods, it's more than just a number. Like our 20 year amortization period we could have all of our main, every plan starts out with the big unfunded at the start of its existence. And then after 20 years, that big amount falls off and all that's left are those little incremental bases. It's still 20 year amortization, but it's a lot bigger if it's 20 years and you just like uh, adopted a big plan increase or something and the base is huge. So it's more the, the amortization period is important that it's, it's kind of just part of the story. Well, yeah, it is, uh, but it is, a, it is part of the story in our guidelines, so we have to give it some weight. Um, I, I'll come back to my suggestion that we need, we need to have some more discussion yeah. on this, but let, I think it's better probably, and I'll be glad to, to, to join in on that discussion, trying to find a, what, what is a, what is the best approach? It may be that footnoting with explanation footnotes will will be helpful. Um, it, it, I'm certainly not trying to to minimize it or hide it in any way. Quite the opposite. It's a it's a very very desirable, and some actuaries would say uh, it's the best. It's the best way to fund uh, fund every piece and change it with amortization periods each time it would. Uh, uh, there is a new element added. Others would say it's overly complicated, but nevertheless, in terms of meeting an objective for proper funding, it's it's a, it's a solid approach. So our challenge is more just how to explain it and and, and footnote it. Or I, I would worry about just putting 20 as being misleading because it's not all 20. But uh, but I think we can work on that. Uh, follow up from this meeting. Work on. Yes. What about those plans where the amortization period is set by statute? Well, when we if we say the amortization period is set by statute, uh, do we do we really mean that that's the amortization period, or is that just a, a, a number that that is put in? That is, if if it's if, if the verbiage was uh, along the lines of the actuary will determine a, a required contribution, recognizing that the amortization period uh, uh, will be, for amortizing the unfunded actual accrued liability, will be 25 years, and the rate varies, but it's the rate needed to have a 25 year, then that is a rate part of a package, but a rate in a statute that is, uh, is okay. If it's saying that uh, we've got a GASB, we have the old GASB, and we have a 30-year uh, amortization as to uh, is our goal, but by the way, we're not contributing at the level needed to fund 30 years, then that 30 years is is not a realistic estimate of what the amortization period is. So we really have to look at each each situation. Leslie. Yeah, I wanted to comment on, you made a comment about the pick, uh, you're really focusing on entities that don't uh, pay the, the, the full arc, and that, that even though they might have put a 30 year period down, that uh, uh, that if they're actually contributing less than that, then their amortization period is only not 30. And I guess we can maybe, Chris, we're going to talk about this in the next session, next in that other section, because we have a, a weird phase in that we allow, but but they still pay it off over 30 years. It's just that the other rates for the remaining 29 years or 27 years or whatever 
are, are increased, but the total still gets you there at the end of this period. I think we, uh, again, would be saying, saying to you the okay. same thing I did to Chris. I think these are important points, but I think it's probably better to work with staff okay. than perhaps pull me in uh, if this is okay with the other committee members in terms of a, a, how, we, how, do we, how do we define that clearly without having to take six paragraphs to do it is, is a challenge. But definitely follow up with Chris. We want to we want to be accurate as accurate as we can on this. We talked a little. We talked about it when we when we met with him. I just wanted to, you know, we definitely don't want to be transparent. Whatever the committee would like, we just are concerned that it could make us make some entities look like that they are not funding it over their required period. Which in our case, they are. It's not a holiday. They have okay. to make it up within okay. that same time frame. And, and members, we do have some information that we discussed on a staff level with TCDRs and TMRs that we were going to, uh, that are in your packet uh, that we were going to move to a little later. bit later if that's okay. okay. Perfect, yeah. Anything else right now? Go ahead, yeah. Chris. Um, uh, moving on, the, the next item uh, relative to the study that we have presented is the preliminary analysis of historical information for the study of public retirement systems. This essentially concludes the staff's research on uh, the information that we have on all the state systems. Uh, I'll walk through briefly the kind of data points. Again, the first page uh, highlights the amortization breakout for the systems uh, between the greater than 40, the systems between 25 and 40 within the minimum range but above the recommended range. And those systems less than, uh, equal to, or better than the recommended range for the amortization period. Then we have the asset values uh, based on the total net market value of assets. We are not in receipt of most 2013 reports yet. The vast majority of those will be coming in between now and the August 4 meeting. Uh, that poses a challenge for staff that, that we will address here shortly. Uh, kind of moving on to page two, just to walk through uh, the systems and one of the, the items that we identified for the actual history review were uh, the number of systems that were closed or frozen uh, between 2000 and 2013. Uh, and so for, for some of the aggregate information, we, were, we pulled some of those systems out um, or new systems that were created. We did have some systems that weren't in existence in 2000. Uh, so trying to compare their amortization periods when they didn't exist. So these were systems, those 80 systems were in existence in 2000 and existing uh, as we did our most current look. Uh, you can see kind of the breakout uh, of the amortization period and the shift uh, from those below 30 to those above 30 for the most part. Um, as well, we started looking at the funded ratios and, and the overall decline, particularly for systems with amortization periods over 40 years in the funded ratio. Uh, that, that trend also held for systems with amortization periods between 25 and 40 years. And, and, and really, I think what we identified in the actuarial history review is that for a number of systems, uh, the funded ratios have declined uh, since 2000. And that has corresponded for a number of them with an increase in their amortization period. Uh, the systems who have amortization periods of less than 25 years, uh, the 18 systems that were uh, in existence then and now, uh, that there's been somewhat of a deterioration in the funded ratio, but not as significant uh, as the other systems. And that last table on the bottom of page three identifies the asset to liability growth grouped by amortization period, uh, the rate of growth from 2000 to the current valuation, uh, and does show that by amortization period, that rate is stronger for the systems with amortization periods less than 25 years currently, um, a little bit better for systems between 25 and 40, and, and obviously the systems over 40 years have the lowest rate of asset to liability growth. Moving into the, the financial history review, uh, we did look at rates of return, and I did want to footnote, and we did include a footnote, that this is based on Pension Review Board internal rate of return calculation. Um, the PRB 1000 form, which is part of House Bill 13, the Investment Return and Assumptions Report, uh, we expect those returns to come in 
for most systems over the next uh, two months. Uh, however, this was uh, done before those were provided. And, and so this is kind of our, our formula. Uh, but essentially what it shows, I think for the most part, is that returns vary, uh, that systems with amortization periods less than 25 years haven't necessarily outperformed systems that have amortization periods over 40 years. Uh, and that there's a, a wide a deviation in performance on the investment side uh, across the board. Um, so I, I think in even looking at uh, systems over 30 years, over 40 years, when we, we broke it out by amortization period, um, we didn't see a, a significant difference in, in overall investment performance. Uh, again, I think it, it varies from system to system. It's not as much contingent on your amortization period. But uh, overall, obviously, given the decade that we've been in, uh, with significant downturn in 2008, 2009, investment performance um, uh, has been a little bit lower over the 10-year period than it has been over a one- and three-year period as the stock market has rebounded. Um, but again, we, we, we haven't really identified um, that as, as a general trend. Now, within certain systems, investment performance varies. Uh, some of the larger systems have tended to do pretty well. Um, uh, some of the smaller systems have done well. Some of them haven't done as well. Uh, we do have some sample information that we'll get to a little bit later with more detail on actual systems reports to us on their own investment performance. But this is kind of an aggregate look, and, and we didn't really identify um, uh, by amortization period, any significant difference uh, within the groups. If the members are, don't have any questions, I'm kind of move on to the contribution history review, which I think we identified as the strongest correlation to uh, the system's current amortization period uh, that, that there is under item three, I'm sorry, on page six for folks following in the audience and for the members. Um, the percent of ARC paid, uh, the greater the current amortization period, uh, the lower percent of ARC paid. Uh, that, is, I think, is common sense uh, that the contributions made to a system, obviously, if that funds the amortization period. But that seems to be the strongest uh, correlation to uh, where a system as it meets our guidelines. Systems that currently have an amortization period below 25 years uh, have the highest percent of ARC paid. As you move up 25 to 40, it's a little bit less, but still higher than those systems that are above 30 and then those systems that are above 40. And lastly, we've updated the, uh, the contribution shortfall averages. Uh, I think kind of those three points that we've really talked about, that we have seen a, a deterioration in funded ratios, uh, investment performance has varied and that probably the biggest determining factor on a system's ability to meet its long-term obligations is it's, it's the contribution policy. Uh, obviously, contribution policy is affected by or your rates necessary are affected by your investment returns. Uh, to some degree, the systems that have stronger returns may not uh, see a, a, a shifting of contribution rates, but uh, clearly the systems that aren't receiving adequate contributions and haven't over a long period of time. Uh, systems that maybe have one year where they're off in their contribution rates, but those rates go back up, um, tend to have stronger amortization periods. Um, if there are no questions, just moving on to the, the benefit plan provision review. We did look back to the, the 90s and, and mid-1990s and, and began to evaluate information that we had um, on multiplier increases, COLAs, and uh, defer retirement option programs as well, and we do have a, a table that presents by amortization period. Um, there is uh, a larger percentage of plans with amortization periods over 25 years that did provide multiplier increases predominantly in the late 1990s. Um, but there are systems with amortization periods below 25 years that did provide these uh, increases as well, just not at, a, at a, as high a rate. Would you mind backing up to the middle table on page 7 and 10? Yes. Contribution shortfall averages. Uh, appears counterintuitive. You would expect the plans with the longer amortization period to have the, a larger shortfall. Uh, actually, that's, let me clarify that. Uh, that is the shortfall to get to a 40-year amortization period. 
Um, so for, for systems that are above 40 years, uh, and I, I apologize, th this is based on the, the chart that we have for members of the audience. Um, for instance, a system with an infinite amortization period, on average, would need a 3.38 to get to 40 years, 5.24 to get to 30, and 6.28 to get to 25. I, see. I think we should clarify. Yeah, let's one. see if we can think of something right quick to clarify. Well, it's the additional it's, there's contribution. There's 28 plans in that group. It's, a, it's the additional contribution required to achieve that to amortization. Achieve following them to achieve amortization below or and certainly you don't have to you don't have to if you're if you've got a very long amortization period or an infinite amortization period you don't have to contribute as much more <coughs> as a much of additional contribution to get to a 40 year as you do to a 30 versus 25 being the most is what we're trying to say so we need some some wording improvement there. Additional contribution required to achieve uh, the designated amortization, the amortization period below or amortization period, designated amortization period. Let's change that. Members, we do have the updated shortfall report that we provided at the last meeting. Um, again, we just these just kind of overview aggregate information that we've as our, in our review have, have identified. But those we do have those by plan based on the current payroll and projected by the pension review board. The, the last bit of historic information that we looked at was the demographic information. Uh, and again, we broke out the information based on amortization period at the request of the committee previously. Uh, we did break out civilian public safety. And, and we do have a few systems that are combined systems, meaning they have public safety and civilian members, um, the employee's retirement system, the Fort Worth employee system. Uh, both are, are, are large systems that have members and employees retirement system obviously has a supplemental fund. Um, there are a few different systems. CMRS and TCDRs have civilian and public safety in some of their systems. Um, so there are a few systems that have both elements. Um, but th this, these show the demographics and overall the trends have been downward. Um, they've been a little bit more significant of a decline um, probably for systems that have amortization periods over 40 years, uh, and some of the civilian systems have had a steeper decline. Some of those numbers, though, are uh, involve uh, certain systems. I think the JRS-2 system, for instance, has had a, a steeper decline because it's a newer system um, when it was created. So in 2000, there hadn't been a lot of folks retiring, but now, you know, almost 15 years later, you do have uh, a greater decline. So uh, again, when we look at aggregate information, there's so many unique systems out there um, that can impact these numbers. Uh, but generally the trend has been, and I, I think it's pretty standard across the board, that active to retire ratios across the state have begun to decline. Uh, that, that has been a trend that we've noticed. Um, within each system, those numbers vary a little bit, um, but everywhere we look on all of these charts, the numbers have declined. Uh, and so obviously for defined benefit systems, that puts a little bit more pressure on the current contribution base uh, as that is supporting a larger um, retired population. Can you clarify the difference uh, on page eight uh, of the table on top compared to the table on the bottom? What, is the diff what are the differences? What's the, difference? the t table on top is all systems not differentiated by public safety or civilian, just by their amortization period. So the active to retired ratios is uh, all, system, all systems who currently have an amortization period over 40 years, what was their active to retire ratio in 2000 versus now? And then the bottom one is just the plan that you identified as civilian only. I see. Thank you. Worth noting, in case it's not obvious, probably obvious, but it's worth noting that the, the most mature systems, 
systems that have the fewest actors relative to uh, annuitants uh, tend to be those with the long standardization period as well. They've got the biggest road to hope. And one thing, just one comment here. Um, I don't know whether we will get any, uh, we may get a bit of help here because of uh, we're, we're fortunate to have a state that's, that's growing and with growth will come some expansion. This may be particularly in, in the large or the cities surrounding the large cities in Texas. Uh, may, we may get some, some counter push there into more more actives. A bigger number of employees needed in a growing area of a, of a, of a state. I mean, if Plano is landing a new uh, Toyota, uh, that part of North Texas will, will feel some bounce from that in terms of number of employees, as an example. Uh, members on the last page, we try to summarize a bit of what we, we, we presented here and, and discussed. Uh, again, I think um, I've hit on these points, but ultimately the, the contribution policy uh, is the most uh, important factor that we've identified in meeting your long-term obligations based on the amortization period. Uh, the investment performance, as we noted, uh, varies significantly um, from plan to plan, but that we haven't identified that being um, plans with amortization periods under 25 years, for instance, outperforming systems with amortization periods over 40 years. Uh, Non-investment cash flow, uh, a very small percentage of plans we haven't identified with, with cash flow issues over the long term, and, and most of the averages, again, for mature plans are within acceptable ranges. As we discussed plan demographics, we've noticed a trend where there are uh, for plans with amortization periods over 40 years, uh, a lower active to retired ratio. On the whole, all the systems have noticed a decline. Uh, with benefit policy decisions that there's a, a higher percentage of systems have done multiplier and enhancements um, uh, since 1995. However, there are a percentage of systems with amortization periods below 25 years that have also increased benefits. And I would like to note that a lot of systems, and when we haven't gotten to that point, have begun to reduce benefits, added new tiers. Uh, we are going to work through to identify those as we move forward with the study. There are a significant number of systems that have made uh, benefit plan redesigns or modifications uh, in response to that. Uh, overall funded ratios have declined uh, since 2000 uh, and that asset to liability growth uh, has been lowest for systems with amortization periods over 40 years. That, that really summarizes kind of the, the, the historical information that staff have been reviewing. Uh, certainly, um, there's a, a, a fair amount of information we expect to come in reflecting uh, 2013, which uh, could affect a lot of the uh, short-term numbers that we have in here. Um, but this was kind of a look back uh, that, that staff have done for all the historical information that we have uh, that we wanted to kind of use to, to get an aggregate view uh, of the last 15 years or so of, of what's gone on with our public retirement systems. Mr. Chairman, may I make a couple comments, please? Sure. I would benefit, um, and I think that the board might benefit, and we might even consider putting into the report a uh, description of the, uh, the structure, constitutional, statutory, statutory, administrative, that governs benefits and contributions. To what level are uh, plan sponsors allowed to change benefit levels um, and to make or not make contributions? Uh, Keith, are you thinking of that as well? There's more. There's more general uh, comments. Uh, I, I think the overall idea is good. But I think if we drill down deeply, we would have many pages of explanation of nuances and differences among the plans around the state. I think we can probably pull it into sort of some broader statements, uh, but it'd be hard to tackle them all. Like take Telfer firefighter, local firefighter plans. There's, there's a fair number 
number of differences even among those plans in, in terms of the design and in terms of influence. Uh, it's, but it's an important point to, to speak to. I think I'm just saying we may have to generalize some. Okay, yeah, I'm not looking for a research report. I'm not looking for anything that would be uh, <coughs> create a, a tremendous workload. Um, well, the one thing that comes to my mind is the, the constitutional requirement of the state that the state shall contribute no less than six and up to ten or, or some such to the, I guess, the ERS and the TRS. Um, beyond that, just at a high level to inform me and I think perhaps readers of this report to get a sense for um, what, what restraints or requirements are in place uh, with regard to making contributions um, in general. Mm -hmm. We don't need to go plan by plan. Well, we do have... Or to make our, changes to the benefits, sorry. In our uh, guided public retirement systems, we do have charts that provide some basic information on that based on plan statute um, without getting necessarily the level of every single plan. So certain plans created under Vernon's have certain governance structures, some benefits and contributions are set in statute. It cannot be changed unless changed by the legislature through um, uh, legislation. Other systems have the ability to make the bulk changes locally. Um, we do have some information that we can provide on that. So I, I certainly think we can maybe broad picture, give some background. It may be a little bit harder for some of the systems um, that are governed under Chapter 810 um, that have complete local control to know all the nuances of their decisions. But we can certainly identify that these systems have local control versus those that are set in statute. The Telfer systems are governed under Telfer law. Um, we can identify kind of broad strokes about that, uh, statewide systems, and then the systems in Vernon. So I think to some degree we can provide some background on that. Um, although uh, it may be difficult to, to have itemized every, to do a, a detail for some systems. But I think we can get, uh, get a, a good picture of that for you. I'm thinking a paragraph or two. <laughs> Well, we'll have to look at how many charts we have when we get to the outlines. I but think it's going to take more than one or two. But uh, it's an important point that, you, that Keith is making. That uh, uh, maybe the most important point is to, to, to try to drill down to how are how are employers deciding uh, and what is the funding governance over the way they decide what they're going to. <laughs> well, I think funding my, governance my number one issue of the problem that's broadly stated, that's it. They're not contributing enough. Well, I think the point raised earlier about statutory contribution rates and, 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 and those issues is one that we do want to address. I think what we've done in the historic information is tried to identify, and I think that the data speak to it, that the contribution policy is the most significant impact on a plan's ability to meet its long-term obligations. Um, and what we've noticed in our review is that systems that receive insufficient contributions over a long period of time uh, are not in it, that position currently. Um, so significantly less contributions than required to fund a 30 or a 40 year amortization period um, have led to an erosion for several systems. That varies to some degree by uh, a little bit by investment performance and maybe by benefit policy decisions that have been made that may amplify the under, underfunded status of the plans, but contribution policy is the strongest correlation that we found to a system's ability to meet its long-term obligations. Identifying and drilling down to how that is governed, how those decisions are made certainly makes sense and we would want to identify in the report, particularly that within Texas there are a variety of different mechanisms. Some are bound by statute, some are bound by city charter, some are bound by um, agreements with their sponsors, and some there's complete local control to, to make changes. And I think it's a fair point that we should try to identify as best as we can those different governance structures for funding and for benefits. Collective bargaining comes into this. Uh, some have some form of collective bargaining, others don't. Uh, so it's, 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 it's a big challenge, but a very important challenge. Mr. Chen, one other point I, that I think is worth uh, making here, and that is on page 5 of 10. There is an outlier on this page. I think that uh, the board really ought to be cognizant of that. On both of these tables, uh, one of which the, the top one is identifying or focusing on uh, plans with an amortization period of more than 30, and the other is uh, everyone, if I'm not mistaken. 
And that is, if you look in the lower right-hand corner of each of those tables, the 10-year return, the longest uh, period that we've got uh, calculated here, uh, the averages, uh, average returns, um, the uh, TELPRA plans are substantially uh, underperforming relative to, to the others. And I know that, uh, that they're not investing as a competition. Um, but I do think that it is notable that these plans are substantially below uh, the others in the state, and that has to be having a material effect on uh, the funding condition of many of these, uh, and if not the funding condition, then the cost. I would be interested, and again, only if it's easy to get, but I would be interested in what a 60-40 stock bond uh, index fund would have returned during this same 10-year period. And, and one of the, the challenges that the staff have had, and, and I think one of the items we had we needed to talk about with the return information is that systems will be providing their own return information uh, to the pension review board um, with the PRB 1000. We have a, a sample report later. One of the challenges we found with the, the systems, particularly with some of the Telfer systems, is uh, a lot of the smaller, they represent a lot of the smaller systems. And for many years, they provided their financial information in the city audit. And, uh, there have been instances where we may not have gotten the information as, uh, that is, is current for some of the smaller systems or that the um, information is a little bit different from the city audit when we, we identify their actual system. Uh, what we do want to make sure we do in, in looking at that is, is try to in, incorporate their actual reports to us. Um, but we have noted that we use this particular uh, investment ret uh, return report uh, and. We want to make sure that we afford the systems the ability to, to provide that information. Um, certainly, we can look at the, the try to look at the asset allocation. Unfortunately, for some of those reports, particularly with the smaller plans, we don't we don't have an asset allocation uh, provided, particularly historically. Uh, in some cases, it was just investments at fair value, um, and so that's posed a challenge as we've tried to do historic analysis. Um, but there are uh, some outliers that, that we've been trying to work with, uh, try to identify, I think, that have, have impacted those 10-year numbers. Uh, there are a couple systems, uh, and, and Dan can probably speak to a little bit more some of the information that we have uh, received uh, on that. But uh, again, we're, we're, we're trying to standardize that, and, and for some of those systems particularly, we were accepting reports uh, from the city where they included a um, statement, a, a short statement of assets, but it may not break out that, that, uh, that level of detail. Thank you. Do you want me to say something? Or to... Sure. <laughs> in some cases, the, it seems like the most relevant information we get is in the actuarial valuation report. We also receive uh, financial statements, um, uh, sometimes, hopefully from the plan, but oftentimes from the city. So uh, those have varying amounts of, you know, useful information in the, about the plan assets. And, and I think that's gotten better over the last few years. We have the, a lot of, even the smaller systems have uh, done a better job and we've worked with them to get that. But when we look back historically, in a lot of cases, particularly for the smaller systems, we were accepting city audits in lieu of an actual financial report from the, the system, uh, probably due out of, out of cost concern. Um, and we would notice when we look at the valuation, some of those numbers would not line up in, in the sense of um, the city fiscal year ends uh, September, the plan fiscal year ends December. Uh, we, we did have a challenge with the consistency for some of these smaller systems, particularly some of the smaller Telfer systems uh, for us. Um, and so to try to standardize that, so we're, we're trying to analyze it, uh, everybody equally, it did pose a challenge. And in some cases, we did have to take it from a variety of sources. Uh, and I think another item that we noticed in, in and we've talked about is the difficulty in finding the disclosure of the Gatsby arc, particularly with the, in the early 2000s, as we looked back. Some of that wasn't as clear. Um, and I think as we get to one of the recommendations uh, that we've looked at, it's not always clear what the appropriate contribution rate to achieve a 30-year or 40-year rate was. And or sometimes it's hard to identify in the current report uh, that might be a recommendation the board looks at is, is having, uh, recommending that systems actuaries disclose um, prominently what a 30-year rate would require for a system. 
Um, something we thought we would bring up to the committee as we look at the recommendations. But I think that's gotten better in terms of disclosure. And hopefully, with some of the smaller systems, the asset allocation, that information is a little bit more prominent these days. But when we looked back, there was uh, certainly systems that we didn't, we just didn't have any information. Um, so I'm not sure over the long term if, if we can, because certainly if you're looking at a 10-year average, you do want to look at what were they investing in then as an asset allocation to now. Um, that's just been a challenge that we face as we try to collect this historic information. Another thing we can do, or, or, or we, we have actually already set up full procedures to do, is to follow up with individual plans. Okay. This is probably after the session next year, <coughs> although possibly one or two might be started this fall. But uh, the Pension Review Board has a history, if we go back over the last 15 years, of, of having dialogue uh, in Austin, not as, not as first step. First step is actuary to actuary, uh, trying to understand what's happening uh, with the funding of a given plan. But to actually have uh, the final step in that process that we have approved uh, is to invite a particular plan, uh, a chairman of a board and the mayor of a city, for example, to visit with us in Austin about their plan and and to drill deeper right with that plan about what their investment is. The having it is in a, in a broad statewide report is a useful start, but it doesn't really identify focus on that a particular plan well. But we do have that as a as a future plan. Uh, the Committee wants to hear any comments from the members of the audience at this point. Uh, where we're at. Yes, sir. Uh, a couple of comments on the Delta side. Just also the note represents almost half of the total public system in the state, yet less than one percent of the assets. That's just a note. Uh, when you roll into the large municipal plans and the statewide plans compared to the Delta plan, um, it's not weighted necessarily the same. Not, it is accurate to know that returns in the aggregate for the Delta plans have lagged municipal plans and statewide plans. And that's an appropriate issue that Delta as a group needs to address long term going forward. However, they are local players and it's subject to the local voters to determine whether they can ultimately how they continue to play it, more so than what the state the state would determine, other than just compiling information and providing it. I'm curious on the, the page seven of ten, the table in the middle showing the contribution rates required to get to the 40 year, 30 year, 25 year annualization period. Since the year 2000 was used, uh, or going back to the year 2000 was used, compiling a lot of this data uh, because. Total assets available to earn interest does affect what the total contribution of the ARC is. Uh, I suspect that in the next two, three years, as additional actuarial evaluations are, are done, and most of the plans that have a five year rolling average rate of return. Those numbers are going to improve substantially in the uh, at least from the, the local plans. I'm not speaking necessarily the statewide plans, uh, but I'm curious if, if data was available to compare this and say pick a year. What would that have been in the year 2000, 2005, uh, and see what was different? I, I know that. A lot of things that have happened, you know, if there was in your next table below, it showed you increased multipliers, you added colas, you added drops, you added things possibly in that time that affected overall cost. But uh, I just, I just.
this question the reader of the report is going to, there are some, uh, many of which are adversaries of defined benefit plans, are going to look at, well, to get to a 40 year amortization, which we already identified as not acceptable, according to the PRB actuarial guidelines. No, I said it was acceptable, but that in the future, uh, well, I mean, if, if you use the current concern with it being if you use the current PRB guidelines, right. the objective is to have a 25-year amortization. Well, it says that, it, that a, an exam an amortization period of up to 40 years is acceptable, also in those guidelines. It may not be perceived as ideal. Anyway, uh, in, in any case, whether you pick 40 or 25, a reader would say, well, there's 3.38% of pay increase just to get to the 40-year amortization. And I'm going to go over here a couple of tables and look at her. I actually don't want to go to the tables in this deal of what the payroll is of a particular system. And then I'm going to add those up. And that's going to cost how many billions of dollars and get us up to 40. And that is clearly not necessarily an accurate reflection of, of what's going to have to be done. Uh, maybe I'm not making sense, but it's, it's a moving target. I know every, you, you can't look at this. There is no one single component of this. You can look at it and say, okay, this defines good or bad within, within a system. But looking at contribution shortfall averages in the aggregate, it may be useful to look at it from statewide averages to, to local averages, possibly, to see if there's any material difference. There. Do you have any thoughts there, Keith? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't think I do. I may not have understood. Well, and I think the presentation, we do have a chart that actually identifies it within the system, so we can certainly look at that. And again, one of the discussions that we wanted to have with the committee was how much of this coalesces into a written report, whereas do we kind of use what we have and, and kind of highlight the key elements that we've identified? Again, I think the idea that this in aggregate chart may not be useful in the ultimate study. Uh, it's as much as anything to try to identify the trends that we've we know and where the shortfalls are might be better presented in uh, breakout by local plan to statewide systems. And one of the challenges the staff have had is, and I think it's been brought up several times, current funded ratio, you could have two plans at 80% and they tell two different stories. Um, pension systems that are well funded today may not be well funded in 20 years and vice versa. There's a lot of, of there's so much data that you try to interpret, interpret and put into a report that's useful. Um, and I think to David's point that you know what we've been trying to do at least with these charts, and I'm, again, I'm not sure what the committee wants in terms of the final report, how much of this. My thought was that we'd use a lot of this information to uh, make the salient points about what was in there, but maybe scale back a little bit on these charts and obviously footnote and identify more clearly what we're saying. Um, but we do have later on this the individual identified individual projected shortfalls. Um, so it varies from plan to plan. And there are some systems that I think in our projections have contribution shortfalls that are in double, double digit versus those that are not. Um, and one of the questions we did have with the committee members is how much data do we want to include in this in this study? Um, and we we do have the, the sponsor information as well, which we did start to include. Uh, maybe it's a good opportunity to, to move to that portion of it. Um, there are two charts members. <clears throat> I guess we can skip ahead from the... Well, does this get us out of sequence? Or, or is, um, I, I kind of ties in with, for staff, there's a lot of information we're presenting, so maybe it's a, a time to, to dovetail into that discussion. We did present two charts, and members of the audience, there are two tables. One is the projected 25, uh, 30, and 40-year chart, which we previously presented, and then the next page you have the sponsor information that's, that's right there that, that has what we've looked at is the, the sponsor of the system, the fiscal year that we identified, and general fund expenditures, 
the end of year general fund balance, the general obligation debt of the sponsor, then the unfunded liability of the system and the projected 40 and 30 year dollar shortfalls. I think one of the discussion points was to put some context on some of these shortfalls based on sponsor information. Um, and again, this is a sample. This isn't intended for uh, anything beyond discussion at this point. One of the uh, questions we had is, for the committee, is, is this useful? How, how, much, how many sponsors do we want to look at? Every sponsor of every plan, do we only want to look at the systems that are not meeting the guidelines? Um, we've tried to identify, in some cases, it's, it's, the information is it's, it's very clear and obvious in some, particularly with some of the debt. Uh, we, we have limited staff and, and resources. I think there's been a couple instances where we weren't able to track down for the committee meeting uh, the information, but I think to the point raised by the audience is, is you know, how we present the information uh, and, and how, it, how useful is it to the reader um, in trying to break, break out. Well, and it seems to me that within that, we, we've got some practical issues uh, we, need to, we need to have a, our draft report finished by the end of August and and so if it's a close call between whether we have something in or out and we already have it prepared in my mind it's it's in and and so we just have some tough judgment calls about how much we refine and adjust certainly on major issues we need, we need to consider change and I, I guess to for me to try to Chris, answer your question. We, we almost need to take some of these, or like I'm looking at a page called Sample, and this is about the financial information. Uh, is that the page you're looking yeah, at? Yeah, and this too? was, uh, uh, and one of the, the uh, uh, points raised at prior meeting was that the risk to a system over the long term is a lot of it is tied to the sponsor's financial health. And in some discussion, we went and looked at, uh, and I think the ERS was one of the ones where, you know, a $200 million shortfall sounds like a lot, but when you talk $80 billion annual budget, as a percentage of that, it, it may not be that significant. That is a policy decision that's made by the legislature. Um, again, what we were trying to identify is the shortfall amount in dollars. This represents uh, our projection of the shortfall. Uh, but what we've tried to do is go into the most current uh, CAFRA for each sponsor uh, on this list and identify the general fund expenditures. If there's an end of uh, year general fund balance, in a lot of cases that serves as the sponsor's rainy day fund, so to speak. Also look at the general obligation debt of the sponsor uh, that we could identify and then we included the unfunded liability of, of that system. Um, again, we could put, uh, I think the we have so many charts and data points that we, we, it may be helpful to consider what is worth including and not uh, in, this, in this study. Um, I, I think this is, is helpful information as we're trying to examine how far off a, a system may be from being able to get that rate. Um, again, I think part of it is, is the rate set in statute. Is it locally controlled? Is it uh, determined by the legislature? Uh, and how much do they need to get relative to their sponsor's budget? And that's that's what we were trying to look at with this this table. I think that, Mr. Chairman, I think this is uh, really great progress. I find it to be great information, uh, and uh, I think the primary purpose of it is to bring context to the size of some of these numbers. I would ask Chris if you can clarify the uh, what do the columns on the right hand side? Uh, how are those calculated? The dollar shortfall. So that is projected by the the. the the PRB it is the, uh, what we know is the current total contribution rate, what we know is the current covered payroll based on the last actuarial evaluation, and our projection of what the 40 year rate would be for that valuation, and we calculate the dollar shortfall. So if you need 20% of payroll to get to a uh, 40 year rate, you're currently contributing 10% uh, total contribution, and you have a $2 million payroll, mm -hmm. 10% uh, of $2 million would be your shortfall, and it would be a $200,000 to get to a 40. So that's what that is. That's the actual annual dollar amount for ERS that we're calculating on, that they would need on average 200,000 
extra every year for 40 years to pay down that over a 40 year period. So for ERS to reach a full funding over a 30 year period, the estimated traditional <coughs> state con contribution would need to be uh, 246 million. Yes. Thank you. And, and those numbers were also on the preceding chart. And basically we extrapolated when we came up with, I think that was a prior request from the committee, to look at what the shortfalls were. Um, then we took the information and, and the request for sponsor information and we kind of tried to meld them together so that you would identify and, and to, to provide some context of what, for the state, you're talking nearly $80 billion in general fund expenditures, what is, you know, and, and the shortfall for years would be $250 million roughly on an annual basis over the 30 years. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would only suggest that we uh, add a column that divides uh, one of these shortfall amounts into the uh, into one of these other columns to, to create some percentage. I was going to make that point too, that I think we need to get uh, some percentage in here, and uh, maybe that's it. The, you're saying divide, take the projected 40-year shortfall of dollar amount of 201 million, divided by the uh, what the general fund obligations, uh, expenditures, uh, general fund expenditures. Would that be your denominator? Well, in, in the end of, I mean, the general fund balance, again, we, we looked at, I'm not sure how helpful that is. In some cases, that serves as the rainy day fund for some sponsors. Um, when we've, we've tried to look at it, we didn't include, if they have a reserve fund or a rainy day fund policy, it uh, varies from sponsor to sponsor. Some keep a 10% a uh, general fund balance for, basically, for a rainy day fund. Uh, the state has the economic stabilization fund. Um, but as far as annual expenditures by uh, the sponsor in, in the general fund sense, I, it may be helpful just to use that um, as the, the, uh, the denominator. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I would find it useful, and I think it would be a pretty simple calculation to just to, to do it for both, the, the expenditures and the balance. Um, and, uh, let readers recognize so that we could say, and, and I would further suggest, and again, this should not take much time at all, but combining the plan sponsor, so for example, state of Texas has one, um, in some, perhaps in some other table, so that a policymaker can look at this and say, okay, in the aggregate, the state of Texas needs to contribute additional X uh, in order to, to become whole over the funding period, and that X it amounts to Y percent of everything we got in the bank or everything that we spend each year. Well, would you take that idea down through the uh, through the entire list and say there's uh, three Austin plans, so we aggregate we, those three. There's, uh, there's three Houston plans. There's two Dallas plans. And then you get into nuances of like TMRS. I mean, in San Antonio, there's two plans, but one's TMRS and one isn't. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking for something. I'm worried about. Yeah, I'm not trying to create. I am not trying to create kind of a yeah, substantial workload. Uh, I'm, I'm just talking about jiggering with things that we've already got. Um, and so I'll, I'll just leave it up to uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and the staff to decide what. What, what reflects best. I just think that with the available information, we, we are a stone's throw away from getting, I think, some very meaningful metrics of, uh, of the burden here, the relative burden. Chris, your original to the committee was, you know, how much, how much information? I think that obviously, listening to the other two committee members, has been coming upon the ability for it to be accurate at the time of the, that it gets turned in. I, mean, I think that should dictate how much goes in it, to make sure it's, it's complete and accurate. When if, if, if the, the focus is on shortfalls, it may be helpful to, to just focus on systems that are over 40 years currently, um, that do have a 40 year shortfall, uh, and to, that, that's a smaller group, and, and then combine them by plan sponsor as well. Um, it, it will be very difficult for staff to get to certain levels, like say for San Antonio. Well, the, both of those, one of those systems is in TMRS, and one of those is uh, within the recommended range, so there's really no shortfall of contributions currently for that for the San Antonio systems. 
So, and given the time and stuff, it may be more um, uh, expedient to focus on systems over four years from now. I think it's great. Once again, I'm not trying to suggest anything that would create a burden on the uh, on the staff. I know that you all are uh, uh, to the max to begin with. If that's an appropriate, okay, we'll work we through that process. We, I can interact with you some, and we'll try to move in that direction, but, but keep in mind our deadline and our ability to get our work done. Absolutely. Um, uh, so that that's generally to the point of identifying shortfalls. Maybe instead of having aggregate shortfall information as raised by the audience earlier, we can start focusing on maybe a shortfall presentation relative to budget uh, as well. Um, I will just jump back. Uh, I don't know if any members of the audience want to provide any comments uh, at this point on what we've covered. Well, I just have one comment on the. Uh, uh, Using the uh, general fund, um, for example, in the case of uh, our, ours, Houston Municipal, a uh, substantial portion of the participants are not part of the general fund. It's a really, the total, in fact, according to the city, less than half. So, um, so the, the total budget would maybe be a more appropriate comparison. So the general fund is not the total budget? For, just for a big example, would be the airport. It's not included in the general fund, but the employees are part of the system. Revenue funds. Well, and, and we focused on general fund predominantly for this report because I think in many cases that is the case, but in the out in the case of Houston, if that's then perhaps that's one we need to know. Um, and that may be a challenge for cities that aren't here to let us know that uh, plans and spot because if there are some that that are funded out of economic development or an airport uh, fund, uh, we, we could go back um, and do total fund, of course, for some, uh, it's hard to know, is it a fair comparison or not? Um, uh, obviously, the goal is to identify how much the sponsor has available, what are they annually spending, and where are the shortfall amounts, and is it a reasonable amount to possibly make up, or what does it represent relative to the budget committed to that section? So that, uh, maybe Houston is the, the exception to the rule, so to speak, in terms of not being predominantly general fund. Uh, I don't know if we're going to have time to drill down to that level for every plan sponsor. I though. think we probably only need to keep it at general fund level for what we're doing. And admit it's, it's, it's got weaknesses that could be looked at more thoroughly than what we're doing. Well, in the case of Houston, then what we should probably include the additional total budget if their expenditures from all over fund the pension systems. Because that's what we're trying to represent, resources available to fund versus shortfalls. Well, we are. I was trying to leave it more simple that if they have a number for general fund, even with its in, it, it's, he's, he's pointed out a weakness of that. We're, we're back into... I'll admit I'm getting nervous about our ability to go into the, to how much time we have to go into the detail of, of separating out what's in a general fund and what isn't city by city. Um, I, I think for what we're doing, a, a broader measure is what we should consider and keep it easier. So does that, uh, so the staff has to does that mean? Well, you already have a general fund a balance. I was trying to let you basically say, can you operate within what you've already done? Uh, and get, find that number. I, yeah, I would not suggest going and hunting down additional data points. Um, I think what we have here provides a broad sense of the, can provide the broad sense of the size and scope of the problem. And we can uh, um, footnote and qualify this information for the reader to put it into its proper context. Well, certainly there's an opportunity for systems to comment as well on the report. And, and if we do have data points that we need to clean up between the preliminary report and the final report, I think there'll be an opportunity to work with the systems to make sure that we reflect that. I think your point of, of data points that resonates with me that we're we're at or near a point where we don't we want to stop looking for more data points. Yeah. Right. Chris, can I make a couple of comments? 
Jennifer Jones from CRNS. Um, on page seven, number four, um, where you're talking about some of the benefit enhancements that happen, I'm wondering if it's possible with the information that's already collected, if you could make a broad scheme statement about whether or not when these benefit enhancements were done, if they were pre-funded by the plan sponsor, because I would imagine that, you know, for example, if you retroactively increase the multiplier, a plan. I'm assuming most plans did not add an additional infusion to fund that, that they were doing it based on being overfunded at that point in time. I, I think it might be helpful to know if anyone pre-fund the benefit enhancements, if you, if you have that available in the information that you have. Yeah, and we you don't want anybody that's pre-funded. I would assume no. Um, we didn't. S uh, we I can't think of an example of that. There were instances where contributions, uh, a limited number, where contributions were raised in a conjunction with a benefit increase. Uh, They're very limited. Um, there were some, um, but um, it, it is the, the smaller percentage. And, and we can try to identify that. Again, some of it is dependent on what's available to us, and we've tried to standardize the data so we can analyze it. Um, uh, in most cases, though, that's not the case. Uh, if the members are amenable in the audiences, I did want to briefly touch on, and with the chairman, we had had a brief discussion, the um, draft outline. Uh, this was in a discussion with the, the chair uh, in, in Seating this meeting, uh, it's, uh, it's actually the other direction. It, you, several, it's actually, it's the, it was the right it's after the 10 page, the tab right. right after the 10 page report. So it's about, oh, okay. members, it's probably towards the beginning of your packet. And what we've tried to do is, in a very rough, broad term, is to kind of give a sense as to how we see this. Uh, the, the, the study being formulated, the report, um, obviously an executive summary to some extent discussing the directive to do the study, um, an introduction discussing the, the landscape of Texas public retirement systems. Um, uh, it's the page right after it's called the draft page. outline, the header is the draft outline of financial health study. There's a page nine and ten, nine of ten. And sorry, the, for the audience, we, we have them as individual handouts. Did everybody find it? Okay. Um, again, this is uh, for discussion and, and wanted to get some feedback. Uh, moving in, we thought it was important to provide a short section on the actual basics of defined benefit systems, particularly um, uh, the funding mechanism, the financing mechanism, C plus I equals B plus E, the board uh, did provide a, a white paper, and we do have that. Uh, members of the audience, we didn't print out those for you. It is on our website. It is a prior report that we have issued. Members, it's at the end of your packet. There are some elements of that report we think we may be able to incorporate as into this study briefly so that folks reading it understand the C plus I equals B plus E formula on uh, how systems are financed. Uh, the next, we were going to look at um, probably providing, and, and whether it was appropriate here, the uh, current actuarial status based on the guidelines and, and using that to determine each system's current ability to meet its long-term uh, obligations based on its <coughs> funding arrangement. Uh, we could look at uh, the, the funding shortfalls in the sponsor health here. I think some of this will naturally evolve as we start actually drafting it. Um, but we did want to uh, put put some of this out there for discussion. Um, historic analysis uh, to kind of go through and look at some of these these uh, key areas that we've identified. The next session we we talked about a TMRS or TCDRS specific section, uh, and then lastly uh, best practices recommendations, and then obviously lastly maybe some appendices. If you go back to Point two, introduction, discuss the landscape of public systems, including number of plans, uh, DC, DB. Uh, 
that would be one place in an overview to to bring up the the way we count and uh, and David, I, I thought of this when you were talking earlier in terms of the way we count. How do we count a, a, a county or district in TCDRS? How do we count a city in TMRS? If it's if if we're counting it for investment purposes, it's one for TMRS, and it's one for TCD. If we're counting it for plans, it's uh, what 850 plans in TMRS and six or 700 plans in TCD. Uh, and I think it's important to for people to keep that in mind that we have a whole lot more plans than uh, if if we're saying. Uh, Irving, Irving firefighters, and well, how many city plans are there? Well, this, the, the whole North Texas is ringed with cities within 50 miles of Irving, and so is that one TMRS uh, entity? No, it's 10 or 15 cities that are pretty close to Irving. So, from perspective, we need to we need to make both points because those plans are different that way, and they're different in a really if I were a legislature, it would be really different to know that I've got uh, 750, 850 plans and something about the plans that are in my district. Uh, instead of saying, well, they're in TMRS and there's this giant organization. That, that's not nearly as accurate because it's that, that individual city is responsible for their own plan just as much as a Telfer plan. The city's responsible for the firefighters and telephone plan. And we can start on that with just broad statement in number two. Uh, and then we, you know, we we were going to, and I see that you've made a first step look at Chris at a few key items for possible for each city and each county. And I see that somewhere. Yeah, we were gonna get to that towards the end of the sure, this meeting. Wait on that. And again, I think as this will evolve as we actually start drafting uh, the study, but we did, this is kind of our, our first take of kind of the areas we thought we would hit. That's great. That's good. Uh, the next tab, and, and for members of the audience, the next uh, one is really kind of a, a possible recommendations for discussion or best practices. I did want to go over a couple of these because I think these were presented at the last board meeting and I think some folks may have read some of these and thought that these were official recommendations. I think uh, there's some discussion with an impending House Pensions Committee uh, that some of these are, particularly the rainy day fund, that there's a recommendation from the, the board that all systems should have rainy day funds, um, which the board has not made yet. Um, and certainly, uh, I think given some of the funding shortfalls would be farther down the road than addressing contribution shortfalls now. Um, but we did want to kind of go over a couple of these and get some feedback from the members. What page are you on now? Uh, it's prior to that report, I'm sorry, we, had, we should have done a better job page numbering these um, with all the different information we have. And just before that, yeah. right, one, uh, next one. No, 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 no. Other the way. other way. One of the requirements of the study is to include recommendations regarding how a system may mitigate its risk of not meeting its long-term obligations. And between staff review, past discussions, and, and other recommendations that are out there in the public pension world, we've put together a, a combined list of different items. Again, these are intended for discussion purposes. Uh, I, I want, want to make sure that uh, we clarify that uh, for some reason. Um, if, if somebody thinks these are the official ones, I think there was some discussion that maybe the PRB was recommending uh, reserve or rainy day funds, um, but that's not a rec official recommendation that's been made uh, at this point. Yeah, I don't think we had ever wanted, we, don't, we didn't have in mind saying, here's a specific recommendation as much as we 
but instead had in mind describing to policymakers some changes they, they could consider. And if that's different from saying here are things that we we recommend that every plan have a rainy day fund, for instance, so we, we don't intend that at all. We do intend to say a, 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 a rainy day fund uh, is, uh, or a contingency fund, <coughs> is something that if you establish, you, you have more more safety against adverse experiences if you can fall back on that than if you don't. And so here's, from my point of view, that's a useful tool. But we, we're, but we're stopping short of saying here are, here are things we think each person, each plan should do. I, I, I will give some more thought to exactly how I like the term strong funding governance. I think that that for me the strong a strong funding governance is a funding governance that's uh, legally enforceable, and that's hard to get. But but the, the degree of, of and so I are, are something that's very hard to change, like a state constitution uh, percent within that, and as long as you're operating between the minimum and the maximum, you have strong funding governance there, because you'd have to repeal it or amend the constitution to take that out. It's very unlikely, so you're going to get it. It's going to come in. If it's a, if, if it's a statute, uh, the statute may or may not be strong. It can be amended more easily than a constitutional provision, for example. Uh, a strength that county and district and TMRS have, in my opinion, is that they both have strong funding governance because the employer required to make the contribution is not the one who, who decides. It's an obligation to make the state con the contribution, uh, and, it's a, and it's a legally enforceable obligation Correct me if I'm misstating this county or TMRS, but I believe that's accurate for them. So they have strong sure funding governance. Sure I'm sure how legally enforceable it actually is. Do you have very many that are? Yeah, no one's ever tested us. I'm not sure what we could do to get the money to. We've had a couple yeah. that have been a few months late, and, and some, but then they, they caught up and we've never had a problem. Uh, okay, so just for preponderance for, for 850 cities and 600 counties is they're making the contributions. Yeah, we would immediately shut down any plan. Uh, that so that's a good example of strong funding governance. Mr. Chairman, I would note that the state of Tennessee earlier this year passed a bill signed by the governor that requires local retirement systems to pay their full annual required contribution uh, starting in six years, or the state uh, has the authority to. Uh, Yeah, that was, that was, that's strong governance. <laughs> that's shockingly strong governance. Uh, I believe that might have been some part of the House Bill 3356 last session. Um, I think it was actually, maybe it was 100%. Yeah, there was some discussion of some of that. No, okay. No, but then there was some discussion, or maybe it was that they achieve 100% funding. I think that was the, a portion of it, but. There was, uh, there will be some discussion of some of that element at the uh, upcoming House Patches meeting. Let's let's let me get a feedback from other committee members. And Chris, uh, we were we were asked among other things in our in our study to to offer ideas on things that employ that retirement systems might do to strengthen their the financial condition of their pension plan. Do we reach out and uh, and include in our list, this is strictly a list of things that might be done. Do we put on the list Tennessee? Or do we say that's going, you know, that's a different state, but it's, it's, it's the concept. I think the concept is worth mentioning and getting feedback on. Mr. Chairman, with regard to this study of the financial health public retirement systems and these uh, um, possible items for a committee discussion, I think that it might be uh, worthwhile at some point having plans that wish to uh, give 
share this with them and have them come back and let us let the board know what they think about this. Like we just put it in the report, they're going to have an automatic review period. That, yeah, the, 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 uh, the, the board will establish at the August meeting a period for the systems to comment on, on the study. Uh, okay. thing. So if this is in there, if we, if we just put in as a tool or an information point the Tennessee example, then they will have time to comment on it. I really like the idea of them having time to comment. Legislatures like to pass legislation. They're going to bruise through this report. They're going to glaze over the charts, and they're going to go straight to the recommendation page. Uh, I guess that begs the question of, of um, initially, do we include more or less, or do you know how much? How, how, are any of these that, that 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 are in there concerning? Is there anything that? Um, Again, I think the concern would be putting something in, and obviously when we hear back from the systems in the full comment period, if there's something that either was not included or there's potential issues with a, a possible recommendation, we can address it. Uh, but if there was anything now that, that, that we may want to consider uh, not including or we haven't thought of yet, uh, that was part of the reason to get this uh, before the committee and before the members of the audience as well. The only, uh, the only possible concern I might have would be I would think perhaps that some of the smaller funds might uh, uh, feel that they do not have the resources to uh, affect all of these, these uh, changes, but otherwise I think the list is outstanding. And as long as they have, have a, if the cities have a chance to comment, you're again supporting of putting in uh, the Tennessee example that you raised. Sure. I think we're at the na at nationally. We're at a we're we're not at a crossroads. We're at, we're in a continuing challenge to do well with our pension plans. Texas is doing a lot better than most, I think. But but we too have have to take a hard look at things that are are out there. And maybe we say, no, we're not going to do that. But but it's out there. It's a, it's an idea. I just got a couple of comments on your item number seven that you might consider including some additional things, your benefit policy decisions. I think it, it's important to look at the adequacy of benefits as well, not just the funding sites. You really got to look at them together. And then secondly, I think it's, uh, it might be useful to note it's good for plans to have the ability to lower benefits if they need to. That it's, you can the contribution lever is not the only lever that's available. And finally, I think it's important. There's a huge difference whether or not you participate in Social Security. And that, I don't know, but like teachers, hardly anybody participates in Social Security. So they have a, 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 a different uh, equation they're trying to work than plans that do participate in Social Security. So just thought to throw those three ideas out there. They were, Chris, your ideas, lowering benefits. Yeah, there is there social security coverage? What was your third one? Yeah. Did you have a third? Just benefit yeah. adequacy in general. Benefit adequacy. Yeah, yeah you can't look at just funding in a vacuum. I find, I think the idea of benefit adequacy is, that one's tough because it's, it's, it's pretty subjective in terms of what, what, What's adequate to one person is not to another. And I'm not sure I agree with, with the adequacy of something, and or to do it to do it well. I think it would require <clears throat> quite a bit of detailed analysis. Mr. Chairman, I view benefits adequacy more as a process, and that is uh, that, that the plan sponsor ought to consider um, what a uh, typical employee is uh, is likely to get out of the plan that they're providing. And to take an extreme example, on a pure defined contribution plan, for, for example, it's very difficult to know what an employee is likely to get out of that. And a pure defined benefit plan, we know for certain. Uh, and I think that knowing that the employer has given some consideration to what a, a ten-year or career uh, employee is going to get out of the plan, I think is uh, perhaps what Chris is, is, is speaking to. Yeah, well, I, and I, was, I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah, I thought this know. was in terms of what this is like a. Bible for plan sponsors for is that what you're trying to create? 
you know, our, our, in, our, in legislature, yeah. you know, our, our legislature first, because mm -hmm. that's who we're writing the report yeah. to, but, but also plan sponsors. Yeah, and, and stated, stated uh, being aware of the, of the benefit level and, and deciding the reasonableness of it, stated broadly that that makes sense, trying to develop specific break points like 72% is adequate or uh, is where I, I don't think it would go that far. I just remember listening to uh, some testimony about expenses for privately held equities and funds like that, and there were some people were so caught up in the expense that they didn't look at what created the highest net income at their right. expense, yeah. which is really the bottom line. To me, if you, if you just focus on one side without giving uh, the lawmakers at least a view of, of the yeah. other side, they're not going to see it. Thank you, Repair, and then Leslie. Thank you. Uh, will we have an opportunity to review the recommendations before they're presented to the legislators? Yes, the preliminary report will be available uh, to all the systems uh, before the final report is issued. And we can make comments. Yeah, that's part that's of the. What it's for. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the legislation board provides board. a comment period for all systems. Uh, and then the board can incorporate uh, in, in any of those comments. And we will, I think the intent would be to have a section of all comments made too uh, as an appendix. Yeah, so instead of it, we're not going to edit. I mean, we will we'll consider whether we want to modify our report based on the comments, but we're also going to attach the comments. So it's not going to be publicized report. simultaneously. Say what? The reports, not, the recommendations are not going to be publicized simultaneously. A draft report will be produced and then. My understanding is the report will be modified to possibly reflect uh, comments. The draft report will come out uh, late August, early September. Uh, at the, the the draft report will be presented at the August 28th board meeting, and then uh, pending board approval of, po of releasing that draft report uh, and establishing a period of time for systems to comment. Uh, it will be made available for the systems to comment, and then those comments, uh, the board can consider revising recommendations based on the system comments, uh, and then issuing a final report to the legislature by December 31st. And the draft report will be sent to all of the all of the systems. Is it? And and this is a question for you that I probably should know the answer, and I don't. If somebody else wants to look at it at the draft level. It's going to be made publicly available. It is so public. We'll put it on our website. But we're not going to send it to every legislature. It is aid, but if they want a copy, we'll give it to them. Yeah, the uh, systems the are the ones we're asked to provide the, the draft to. So certainly, we want to make under the direction of the legislation. I'll read the legislation specifically because it's very much spelled out in there. What, well, what, what the, we're to do. Uh, the prevention, Pension Review Board shall provide each public re retirement system covered in the report a reasonable opportunity to review the portion of the report and the recommendations applicable to that system an opportunity to submit a response to the board. The board may revise its report after considering a response. Uh, not later than December 31st, 2014, the board shall, sh shall submit to the legislature the final written report, including the board's recommendations and a copy of the responses provided by the public retirement systems. So similar to an audit uh, where management has an opportunity to respond, it, it'll be very similar to that. If we get a if we get a comment not from a system but from a legislator or a staffer, do we consider that too? It's a more of a procedural question. It's not really included one way or the other. I think that's at the board's discretion. I'm not sure the legislature will pre-comment on a report we're going to issue to them, though. That's true. At least not in a written form. Maybe not the legislature, but uh, media. The media may pick it up, even if yes. you know they may not identify that it's a preliminary report, or it may be misconstrued. Or the usually the, the first information, the original information that uh, broadcasts it is what is retained. And I think uh, in some of the recommendations that you uh, obviously. And I guess to the point of, well, what about, what if the media comments, what do we do with that? I think that's something that's a board we need to talk about. 
don't you? I mean, it, it's it's not spelled out but beyond. I mean, we're, we're to get it to the systems. The systems are to respond, or or, or not R2 may respond if they choose. It's silent on who else gets it. Do we consider there are comments or not? But the other option is to just put draft on, all over the front of it and send it directly to the systems and, and without, unless it's requested, publicly requested, not put it on necessarily on the website to the board to approve the final report. That may be a more appropriate approach. Mm -hmm. Given in light of those comments and, and certainly um, I, I think with the intent of the legislation is that we're not asked to provide it to the legislature until December 31st. I think we ought to discuss this with the, the whole board, just this procedural point. We can include that at the August 28th meeting from the procedural yeah. point of view. Let's, did you have something, Leslie? Yeah, I was going to ask about item two, the reserve funds, the rainy day surplus management. Um, the, is that in addition to, uh, and these are just recommendations, right? These are, uh, in all cases, even in the final report, it's just going to be a recommended thing for systems to do, not a requirement, right? Correct. Okay. Because uh, cause different funds have different needs for reserves. I mean, we, TMRS has, you know, we depleted all of our reserves with the exception of 100 million, uh, which may seem like a lot to a lot of people, but wouldn't be very much to our individual cities if we allocated it. Um, because with our restructuring bill, we eliminated the, you know, the leveraged effect of the returns to our cities. So we didn't, we no longer needed to, to keep, you know, big reserves for, for big downside losses. That's all now captured. Each city has their own little reserve fund, if you will, in our deferred gains. Uh, they all got distributed back and they all have been deferred, you know, deferred gains. So that kind of operates as a, our asset smoothing policy operates as a, as a little reserve fund for each city and it eliminates the inequity between cities. In other words, if you kept it in reserves at the system level and then and then granted to those reserves back whenever returns were low, then they would go back to cities in a different manner than which the assets were, were put in. So if, if we, when you, by giving those reserves back, we eliminated an inequity that existed between employers when they got them. So, um, uh, are you talking about in addition to your smoothing policy, creating a reserve fund? Or well, it, I mean, it seems to me we're saying we'd be sending this to TMRS, this, this draft report, and within it we'll make reference to considering a rainy day fund, and that's it. And okay. based on what you've just told me about TMRS, you said, well, we're already doing it. We don't need to do anything. Okay. Else. I mean, we're not, we're, we're putting ideas out to the legislature and uh, yeah, I think these are intended for discussion purposes only right now. These aren't well nuanced recommendations. I, I my just in discussion, I think one of the concerns you would have is is it more important to have a rainy day fund or get your contribution rate up? I mean, this is right now is just to get some discussion. Um, that that's that's really what what staff had intended uh, with this, based on what we've seen. There are some systems that have a reserve fund. It did help offset some of the losses. Um, I don't think we were ready to advance this as a full recommendation. And I think the, for the committee members, at least from the staff's point of view, just wanted to have some discussion and, and feedback. And hopefully, as we proceed over the next uh, several weeks, as we move towards the August meetings, that if there's any feedback from the members or folks that, that they provided to us. I, again, I don't think these were intended to be in a specific one, two, three, four. These are the priorities either. Um, but so they're, they're not priorities. Yeah. No, and I think one of the questions raised about the size of pension funds, their ability to take on some of these, I think we're going to need to caveat a lot of this report. <laughs> so, um, but I think one of the comments raised very early in this discussion process was to consider that legislation could be born out of this and that any recommendation included in here has been thought of in that, in that context as well. Uh, if there's no other comments, um, Skipping ahead a couple pages, members and audience, we, we have the investment return and assumptions report with the big sample across it. The so next item we just wanted to show, and again, I guess to all the data points, this may not be something in terms of the August report that we, we are, were prepared in, but we are starting to receive some of these figures in from the systems. Um, 
we put together a draft report that at some point I think we're probably going to have to produce for the legislature, given this is a new reporting requirement for all plans, uh, whether we include it in the Guide to Public Retirement Systems, which uh, maybe a lot of these data sets that may not make it in would be appropriate to put in this prior to next session. Um, but this is some of the information that was required to be submitted to the Pension Review Board. Uh, one year, three year, 10 year gross and, and 30 year gross and net rolling uh, rates of return. And uh, we did include the assumed, current assumed rate of return for the systems. Again, these are, these are just, it's just a sample. We've received a few more of these reports, but um, these calculations aren't thorough. They're just, it's just intended for an example for the members as to, um, if we're, my suggestion, if we're going to include individual plan return information, that we include the information the systems report to us. Mr. Chairman, I'll tell you, I am uh, wary of presenting uh, a list of investment because they're so commonly misunderstood. And the, the uh, um, reaction of most readers to a list like that will be to look at one or more systems and s see how they compare to everybody else on the list without really understanding the nuances of investment management, knowing that there are risk levels involved and other factors that are not evident in the information that's provided. Um, and I think that the board should consider um, presenting information in here that is grouped by uh, some of the ways that, it was, that we were discussing earlier, the size of the fund, uh, municipal, state, TELPRA, uh, other characteristics related to the funding level, but the, a, a raw listing of investment returns by system uh, can, lead to, uh, can lead to bad outcomes. Well, but aren't, I mean, I, I'm sympathetic to what you're saying, but it, aren't we already required to do that? Didn't, didn't the law that was passed this last session require identification by individual plans? Well, no, it did no, not. It I did mean, not. this is this information is now required to be reported to the Pension Review Board. It's a new report. The board adopted a PRB 1000 form. Uh, one of the questions, though, was, is, is this something that we want to include in the study? I think we have discretion. There. We have discretion there, but the, this may be something that's requested because it's every system has to provide this information to us, or if they don't have it, they have to provide a, a statement saying that they'll provide it when it's available, that it's unavailable. Um, this is now required by law, and it's public information now. Um, but there's a fair point of whether this is helpful in the study. Um, and so this, again, this is a sample. This is not, um, most systems haven't reported this because they have uh, 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 December 31st deadline or fiscal year ends. The deadline for those submissions will be at the end of July, as you can see. And there's, a, I think, several systems we haven't even gotten on this list yet because we were scrambling to get this put together. One of the thoughts was, do we even want to include this type of information in the study? Um, we may need to have something like this ready to go next session uh, if requested. But again, I think what we're trying to do is get some discussion, and that's a fair point of whether or not. This is properly interpreted. Does it serve the purpose of the study? Um, these are the numbers reported to us by the system. These are not our calculations uh, based on our, our formula. This is based on the PRB 1000 form uh, and now required under state law. But we did I, think if we were, I'm sorry, we were going to say if we were going to include any individual numbers by system, it should be what they've reported to us, not what we're internally calculating for them. And, and I, I was going to say There's the last part a quality of control problem there, you know, if we're, if we're counting on what City 1 says or, you know, Firefighter Group 2, we may have some real poor, poor quality uh, in some of the numbers we get. And, and our hope is eventually whatever we report in the aggregate is based on the 2013 numbers reported to us. Uh, a lot of systems don't report that information to us, or in some cases uh, we get it from other sources. Uh, this will be from the plans themselves. Um, again, it's just it, it's it was for discussion purposes to get a sense from the members that they thought it was appropriate to include anything related to this in the study. Well, based on the concern that Keith has raised, I mean, I think we should not include this this information in in this special report we're doing to the legislature 
but we have the information and and well, maybe you're interacting with legislators or, or staffers enough to say, well, we'll provide it. We'll provide the information that's been given to us by the time the legislature arrives, but but not in this report would be what I think we should do. And certainly, it did. That's the, that we did want to make sure um, we, we cover that. And we do need to be prepared, I think, going into next session for some questions about what we're seeing in those reports. Um, but it, we did want to just make the committee aware that we are starting to receive that information. And I would assume that given 2013's strong uh, investment performance that some of these numbers that we've seen as well will tend to go up um, as we get those financial reports in. Uh, members, the last uh, two kind of items for discussion that we brought were the, uh, based on prior discussions of including information on Texas County District or Texas Municipal staff has had preliminary discussions with each system and presented based on co uh, kind of comments with some of the members uh, to the systems some possible aggregate information uh, based on discussions and, and obviously we've gotten some feedback on tailoring some of this to fit the, the uniqueness of each system uh, and we have discussed with both systems the uh, possibility of including items in, in the aggregate related to amortization periods funded ratios and contribution rates uh, and I think we will be fine-tuning that based on some of those staff discussions and certainly wanting to work with both those systems going forward. Um, also at the discussion with the committee was including with for each participating county and district and, and, and a participating city uh, a name, a current contribution rate, funded ratio and amortization period and possibly um, additional information. There has been some comments raised, and, and each system is unique, and, and obviously we have the members of the audience who can, can speak to that. Um, but certainly, uh, I think that it, um, we, we try to engage the systems and, and to see what makes sense and what doesn't. For and are we able, do you believe, to, will they be able to work with us and electronically give us this information formatted in the columns the way we can then put it in our report. I think we can work with them. We may need to fine tune some of this a bit, uh, at least uh, initially, and, and I think um, that they probably both have comments that have been touched on, maybe want to go into a little bit more depth right now. Well, I have, my only concern is I, I, I like, I was, I was uh, thinking maybe we could look like QCDs, schedule, <laughs> particularly at the bottom, and just have a, a four and five. And, and the reason I say that is, I mentioned this before, I, we actually, we ladder just like P TCD does, Bob. We, we're closed amortization, and we do ladder. Uh, with, uh, with, with our changes that we just did in 20, uh, with our 2013 vow, we actually combined our ladders, because we had so many from 2007, we now combined them into one. And many of our cities have, uh, you know, their amortization periods are in, you know, they might be, you know, like, uh, for instance, Carrollton's single period is now 16 years. But, but they're new, small ladders, are on either a 25 or 30 year, like the, the gains and losses and futures. But in 16 years, that big base will be gone. So they'll basically be right at 100% funded. But so we do calculate, I don't, Chris said they don't, we do calculate a single period, what, what the equivalent single period is. And that's what I'm going to provide, um, what I'm going to provide to y'all. So for us, it will be fairly easy to, to, to give you your amortization period. We're, we're going to give you this equivalent single period. But, but what we actually do in practice is, is ladder, and the, cl closed ladder. And let's see, we're, you're going to give us the employee contribution rate and the employer contribution rate? Um, is that what you, actually I was giving, what, what this, what it says, it's just, just the employer. employer. Uh, well, that's well, part of the, I think, what we've initiated some discussion is what makes sense to include. Uh, I think, again, we haven't decided, there's no, formal this is in or out type of discussion it's more of what makes sense um, and so we can we can certainly give the employee contribution rate easily uh, and, and the employer now uh, I actually want to address the, the, the phase in part uh, because compared to TCD schedule the only difference is your items uh, let's see I guess what is it here y'all have a at the bottom um, yeah, you have uh, uh, item five is just the, the list of uh, districts that 
uh, counties and districts that enact, enacted plan changes. Whereas you asked for additional information, two additional things for us. And that's where the ones where they actually are contributing less than there are um, because of the phase in or stat max. We never have cities that the stat max effect, so that's, that's never an issue. Um, obviously, we have cities that contribute less than the phase in, but my concern is this. That, that what we provide um, is going to lead the reader to believe uh, that they're going to say, oh my God, in their districts, so, so somebody's looking at these cities that are in their district and say their actual contribution rate was less than what their ARC was. And that makes it look like that they're not really funding it over their required amortization period when uh, there's, to me, that's different than if somebody that's just taken a contribution holiday because our closed amortization period, there's, like I said before, the rates, every year they don't make that rate, the next year rate's gonna go up for the remainder of the amortization period. So they're still gonna be funded at 100% over that same time frame. It's just that they're, they're gonna be stepping up uh, uh, and where the last 27 years are gonna be more because maybe for three years they, they phase in. So they still get to the same spot. So it's misleading to me to say these are cities that aren't paying the rate. They're not, you're right, they're not. But they're still gonna get to the same spot at the same time because we may. Well, why not say the latter point in a, in a footnote? We, we I mean, can. I just, I just think true. there'll still be a focus on it. They'll treat them like other cities. They'll look at the other list and, and, uh, and we will. Well, it'll, that's why it'll take us more time to get this to you because we're gonna have to really uh, footnote what, what's actually going on. Well, let, let's talk about it some more before you put a lot of time in, but, but okay. not today. Okay. Uh, uh, and when one of the discussions I think came up was both systems is they project out, like, so the 2013 VAL are the rates for FY 2015. Right. So the question is, do you have the current rate as it was paid, or do you have the projected rate going forward? I mean, there's a lot of nuance to both systems that and, and I, we staff appreciate the effort that we've had in, in discussion with both systems. I think we want to make sure that we accurately represent to the legislature what's going on. But uh, and I think with TMRs having a phase in, slightly different than TCDRS. Um, in some of the discussion, I think with TCDRS, one of the things we discussed was whether or not to include some on the one sheet, uh, something about the benefit level, the accrual rates. Um, because that may, if you're looking at what the employer's putting in, that may be directly tied to the accrual rate. Um, so there's, with any of this, there's so much information that we're trying to, you know, when you try to present it in a way that the legislature will look at it and understand what you're trying to say, there's so many nuanced levels uh, that we, we would get to. Well, I was trying to limit it to a information that we could put on one line per city or per county, and, and I would, I'd be inclined not to get into describing the benefits, but to just be describing the contributions by the, I would say, by both the employee and the employer. The reason I put the employee contribution rate in is I think there are a, a number of people that are not knowledgeable about public plans. They just compare, they think of a retirement plan being a corporate plan where there are no employee contributions. So. They don't get the full appreciation of how these plans work without knowing that there is an employee contribution rate also, and here's what it is. So I would show both rates. Mr. Chairman, to the extent that I have some responsibility for uh, asking that the plans and the TMRS and the TCDRS be included in this report, um, my interest there was that the legislature has asked for a study of the plan statewide, and I felt that we would be remiss not including that. Uh, in my view, that does not mean we need, need to get into great detail about these, the plans that are in the TMRS and TCDRS. I just wanted to be sure that legislators who have an interest have the information, particularly with regard to outliers, so that if there's a plan in their district or somewhere in the state that has got uh, problems, that legislator is know, uh, knows about it. There, as you alluded to earlier, there's more than 1,400 plans in these two uh, systems. Uh, substantial portion of the participants and the money on the, and their liabilities are, are embedded in these two systems and we would be remiss to not include them. But that doesn't mean we have to go into great detail. And that's why I was reaching for the, what, what page is before? That's prior to that. Uh, 
immediately prior to that. The financial health study. Which after that, uh, right there. There's one that's the aggregate. I was thinking I had. No, there's a line on line four. That would be the. Yeah, and didn't I see a printout of what? What that might look like on the line. No, no, that was that's yeah. not. Uh, it, there was some information, but it, it kind of the interest of time and space, we didn't include all those. Uh, we can certainly provide that to the committee. Um, we do have TCDRS to give us a, a sample that I, I guess I hadn't gotten an electronic copy, but we could certainly get that to the members. Sure. Um, I mean, that was in both cases. You're talking 10, 15 pages long. Um, I, one of the questions, I guess, is we look at our our timing and everything. And, Again, we do have the guide to public retirement systems that we issue prior to each session. Uh, maybe in the individual list, it makes more sense to include it in, in, in something like this as opposed to our study where maybe we focus on more aggregate information, uh, working with the two systems to the point of outliers. Um, and and, I, and we can certainly work through the members if there's an outlier point, uh, whether it's a contribution rate or an amortization period. Um, that we could we could work through with some description of it versus again if we it, and it's up to the committee to give us some direction if we want to include each individual participant in the study in a listing um, I think we Chris we were on twelve pages on the list you provided us or? yeah basically it was one line per employer mm -hmm. and had and had all basically all the basic planning provisions and then we well, highlighted if one of the things you asked for is if how many plans changed plan provisions? And we could just say 60 and list the numbers, but it doesn't say, well, this one went from eight year vesting to five year vesting, or this one dropped their match from 200% to 100%. If you want us to just provide the list of the names, we can do that, but I think it's more helpful for us to actually list out the provisions and show the ones that have changed. Well, my, my overall, and I may, I may be, have a minority view among the other of my committee members here, is it's really misleading to just talk about TMRS as one system and TCD as one system when it, become, when it moves to the area of adequacy of contributions by an individual in city or county. And I think that any, so I'm, I'm I'm not real, I mean, I'm, I'm all, all for some summary like this, but I do prefer, I do have a real preference for showing key information about each city and each county in this report. Because otherwise, I don't think, if I'm trying to talk to somebody from in, in the city of Texarkana, but I don't have any information on Texarkana in the report, or the, the county Texarkana is in, I don't think I've really done justice within the report. And so do, as long as we can hold it to one line of information for each county or city, I think that's who we are. I don't, I really worry that when we say, well, we've got 93 plans, not in my mind you don't. We've got 91 plus 850 city plans and 600 counties. I think that's a really important thing that we we haven't dealt with enough. We've misled, not intentionally, but we're we're really missing the point as to what each of those cities and counties are responsible for. But I, I, I agree with that. I could not agree more. But one it has to be one line per system. I ought to do it. Excuse me. Yeah. I was going to say I do have one suggestion on the amortization periods. However you want us to report them, I think you should try to make it standardized. So we're not reporting our, if we do some sort of averaging out of the various bases to get one, one kind of aggregate amortization period for each plan, have that, just, if you have a, a layered closed amortization period, that's the way you want us, all the plans to report. So try to standardize it as much as you can. Well, you have every, you've said every uh, plan in your system has 20 years or less in amortization period. Yeah, Bob was talking about a way like if, if you have, we, we could theoretically have 20 bases, and so Bob was saying, well, you could wait. If you have like a big base that only has one year left, that would cause 
you know, some of your, a lot of your UAL would be amortized over one year, and this would be amortized over two years, three years, et cetera. So instead of having just saying 20, because you had a very last base that's over 20 years, you would kind of aggregate them and come up with one base, kind of weighted base. And that's, and I'm saying that, um, so all I'm saying is that's fine, but whatever, I think the important thing is to be consistent, so whatever you decide, for us decide for the other people, whatever you decide for the, for the, the other systems decide for us. That's all. Do we really need to report amortization period for TCDRS? Because you know, they're not going to have anybody who's 30, 50, or, or anything. I would put down, I'd, I'd like to, to have one number there because they, they hear so much about amortization periods. And so I put it down, but, but, uh, but it's not exactly 20 for every city in every county. Am I yeah. right? It, yeah. it varies. Yeah, it could be, could be zero. The, the, other thing I, the other thing I would suggest you think about is for all the systems, to not just put the amortization period down, but whether, at least whether it's closed, open, or if it's a fixed rate plan, because to me, those are hugely different numbers. Uh, they're not really even all that comparable. Are you referring to TCDRS? No, I'm referring or? to all the systems. Because okay, so you you're saying a, if it's the Dallas Fire and Police yeah, system whoever it that is. we need to define within our within what we say about Dallas Fire and Police whether it's an open or closed amortization period. Or if it's a fixed a fixed rate plan where the amortization period floats. I think they're they're all different beasts. That's all. We, and again we would do whatever rules you came up with. Well and, and back to what your two systems are are I just think some close connected you already are doing this with our staff is it's important. We we ought to be able to find that. But, but we do, uh, my idea is certainly to limit the information to one line for a particular county or city. Um, well, we were, going, we were hoping to provide the single period, which is the, the, you know, the latest average of all the ladders. Well, that's, that's my personal preference, but I I'm, uh, think we ought to hear from the two systems and and uh, I don't think at this point we have to, I mean, ideally we do it exactly the same way, but if that creates technical problems for one system or the other, then, then we need to simplify it some and, and, and go with the variance between the two systems instead of trying to force you to do it exactly the same way. Uh, we can do whatever we just want. We want to make sure that it's really comparable information, that's, otherwise it won't be, won't be useful at all. Well, if you two, could talk to each other and come to a consensus of what's comparable and pass that on to staff here, that, that might expedite this project. So. And I do have kind of one other general comment just with regard to footnotes, is their footnotes. And so what you read is the stuff that's not in the footnotes, and that's your first impression, and then the next part is the second. So to the extent you can keep stuff out of the footnotes, that's in, in I have it up, up top. I think it's a good thing. Well, I, I'd go back and encourage you guys, if you'll work with us, you two, to help. I, I don't see an easy way to do what you're saying, but but if you, you do, we'll, we'll sure consider that. And again, I'm not speaking about TCD. I'm speaking about the whole, everybody. Um, well, when we talk about what we're doing with everybody, I don't know at this time that, that we can easily look at what we're doing with everybody as far as footnotes go. I mean, it, it sounds like we're, we're digging deeper than we have time to dig, but I, I'm not sure of that. Chris, is that your take on it? I think it's inevitable we're going to have to have footnotes. Oh, we'll have to I have mean, footnotes. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we'll try to minimize that to some degree, but um, I, I agree that sometimes it there's some things you may want to disclose in a paragraph form right there, but um, I so like for example, like for the amortization period, you can have 20 O or 20 F or 20 uh, what's it C, and then you wouldn't you could sort of still have a footnote, but they can just see it up there, and you don't have a footnote explaining how you calculate the amortization period. 
that would be just one. city is having two plans or three, they'll have that on three different lines. Okay, then what got me there was a comment earlier that it, it would be useful from the, especially from the public perspective, to know whether a plan participates in Social Security or not. Just a simple yes or no, does the plan participate in Social Security? Uh, thing is, is that you, that complicates it because you have portions of some plans that are and portions that aren't. Do you love that? There is no perfect world, but I think it is useful to have some basic information. Do they participate in the or not? I, I, I'm worried that that's hard, will be hard to put on one line or into a Y or an N and cover it because of what you just said, David, that for this purpose, I'm, I'm inclined not to do that. But I'm interested in the TCD and TMR. Am I right that that's difficult to? We want to include it. And we just want to have that as one column in our in our one row for each plan and just have a wire in or, or maybe it, partial or fewer, you know, you know, partial or something partial, like that. Yeah. We don't, we don't, we have it. If, for the most part, for most of our entities, and but we have, you know, we not. It's not yet. It's not a yes or a no in, in a lot of cases. We just said partial. Well, what I think we need to do is, if, if you two would coordinate some with each other, you're willing to coordinate with each other, and then with our staff uh, to to come as close as we can to a common approach. But but I see that as a as something we do not right now. Uh, is it, I mean, it may be a fair question to ask what we include now versus, I mean, I keep coming back to this. We have a pretty comprehensive guide to public retirement systems that we've issued before every session. I think I've mentioned it before, and we may want to link it to our study. I don't know how much time staff is going to have to have this level of detail in a September 1st report, particularly given that a lot of the systems will be reporting to us in the next two months. It may make sense to, when we get to this level of detail to have something like this go out in December as part of it. Um, there's no way that we can have this updated by the end of, of August with the report we have. Um, unless well, staff works missing. every day of every hour between now and then. Well, and, oh, okay. I'm miss, maybe I'm, we're missing something. I'm hoping that the systems can come up on something, an approach, that would be just one line of information for a particular county or city. But I guess to, to my point is this report in September is not going to the legislature. Um, we're really just going to send it to the plans. Given how nuanced the, the county and district and TMRS want this report to be in their different suggestions, we may need to consider sticking maybe with aggregate for now and as we develop the draft in the fall, include that level of detail. And to David's point of Social Security or not, that's a fair point for every system that's out there. If you want to look at the level of benefits, governance structures, all the points that have been raised, we've covered in this report, now it needs to be updated. But we can't update this until we get all the 2013 reports in. I don't know that we need all the TMRS and TCDRS information by August. I, my, my, speaking just for myself, my vision uh, for their information was uh, in an appendix. Uh, or a separate portion of the report, just so it's a matter of record. That's that is what is there. So it's a complete report that the PRB produces. So if it's in an appendix, it could be, it could be added after August 28. I mean, I think that could be considered to, like systems providing us a response to more updated. We have a lot of systems that are gonna, their data isn't gonna be, in time to us to get into the August 28th report. It's just not. No, I agree, and, and I'm, I agree with what you're suggesting. I think, Kirk, Chris, that we, we won't have it by then. But I, I back to those two systems. It, 
sounds like we might be pretty close between them to being able to get one line of information on each county in each district we can well can easily, before August 28th. We, we can easily get you. I was I don't know what Chris had in mind for TCD. It sounded like he wanted to provide a lot more than what we intended to provide. Uh, we, we can easily provide uh, this information uh, that based on the format that you, that you gave us. Um, and, you know, and, and that's where I've, I've actually, you know, I think Chris has probably already done most of his. I was just going to provide exactly what you asked for, but we were going to have another column, uh, you know, on your sample that you have in front of you. And then we have a, a uh, we did want to explain, uh, for instance, all of our cities that um, uh, if their funded ratio is, is below a certain level, I think we talked about maybe below 70, you know, we were going to say why, like, because they're probably new. And because what we don't want is somebody to have to see this report and go, oh my God, there's funding ratios, you know, 40% when they've only been in the system for, you know, a year. So we don't expect them. So we, we want to, for any of those that that we feel like we need to put an explanation, we want to have a feel for an explanation. And that's where my time will be spent. Is it putting the columns together, I mean, I can do that this afternoon in terms mm -hmm. of getting which I'll ask for. But but it's, it's I can't, I don't feel like I can, put that information out there without an explanation. Um, but well, that's the, part of why I'm saying if you if, if you two are willing to work on this further, and, and here's what here's what we suggest to, to our staff, and we take a look at it and decide whether we can put it in. Uh, but I'm, I'm, it just seems like we're pretty close here mm -hmm. to being able to do this. Yeah, we'll, we'll do whatever you want us to do. Yep, we will. Well, that's just what I'd like to see us try and, and, and get when when we see what you actually can send us, then, Chris, we can talk about it and decide how this works. Yeah. I'd like to make a point, and, and I kind of in response to Chris's question about having amortization periods described as closed, open, or fixed, meaning that it's really a fixed rate, so the amortization period can move around. I mean, what, what we do in our amortization period chart is we show two years worth so you can spot plans that are on a closed period kind of pretty, well, it, it becomes challenging and, you know, it's possible that we could do it is to, to assign closed, open, or fixed to each plan. And that can, may change too. You know, a plan that is now on a closed schedule might say, you know what, we're, we can't be on the, we can't afford it anymore, so um, we'll change it. But um, you know, the, I can, like for example, um, Houston firefighters, they have a, a, a fixed rate over a three-year period. However, it's intended really to be on an open. 30-year amortization. Mm -hmm. So the first year is calculated based on an open 30-year amortization, and then it's fixed for three years. So, what would you call? Would you call that fixed, or would you call that open? So, it's not. There, well, so there is a challenge to doing that. So that's why the, the procedure that we've had in place for a while, I'm sure, two years, is kind of the way we have dealt with it so far, but that is not to say that your suggestion might not, might be better. I, I just, we have to think about that. Well, an, an, I think what he was saying was for all the systems, an, an, an underfunded plan that has an open amortization period is, is a lot different than, than in our situations. The only ones, both TCD and TMRS, the only way we can have an open amortization period is if they're overfunded, because that's our surplus management technique is to and we do call that zero. Yep. Yeah. So um, I think he was referring to, that it, you know, trying to make it so that all of the, not, he's not talking about our specific instances, but for all of them. Yes. There are always exceptions to the rules. Well, Chris, what, is that enough for today? <laughs> It's up to the committee members. <laughs> uh, we did have one additional report that we 
again, a, a sample one, I guess, to the point of trying to uh, keep the data sets smaller. We did have a, a contribution rate and amortization period chart we put together. Um, but I think the general sense from the members is maybe to keep the data sets a little bit thinner for the preliminary report, at least for the systems that we can. Um, but we did want to include that so you could, could kind of take a look again at more data that we have. Um, we could probably just um, quickly touch on it. It's just the, the current rate is, as we have in our database uh, based on the last valuation. But um, again, it's, it's, we haven't vetted all the information on that. And, um, Again, just trying to get a sense from the committee members what, what they thought might be uh, useful uh, in the study. I think that's useful. It, it deals with contributions in employee, employer, total, uh, and it gives an amortization period. Yep. I like it. But should it be in this order or should it be alphabetical? So you, if you were looking for a plan. Uh, yeah, I apologize. We what, quickly what put this order? together. Is this oh, was from the, the highest total rate. Uh, I, I think I'd put it in an alphabetical order. I mean, either way is fine, but it seems like everything else you have is as amortization schedule up. Oh, that's true. That's system. true. You're right. Okay. You keep it in the same it, order as the other charts for amortization. <coughs> okay. Anything else, Chris? I think that was everything that we had to, to present. If there's any additional comments from the audience. Anything else, audience? Thanks for participating in this audience. We'll keep moving along. <laughs>